Hello, I'm Eric Greenberg, Director of Museums for the Newport Restoration Foundation. Thank you for your interest in Collective Perspectives, a series of presentations and discussions about the past and present significance of 18th century Newport furniture. We had originally planned to host these sessions on site here at the Whitehorn House Museum and at other locations in Newport, Rhode Island. But with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to rethink our plans and these sessions were hosted online over a four-day period in July of 2020. The conversations and presentations that emerged from these sessions were really wonderful. They were educational and they were entertaining, and it's a great pleasure for us to show you these presentations on our NRF YouTube channel. Before we begin, let me just make a few observations. First, because these sessions were handled remotely, sometimes the audio of our panelists can dip in and out a little bit, but I believe that on the whole, our panelists' audio feed should be pretty clear and pretty audible. Another point is that at different times in our Q&A uh, and group panel discussions, you will see the image of a young woman on screen who rarely talks during the discussions. That's our manager of education and public programs, uh, Caitlin Seller, who fields the online questions during the discussion uh, session. Also, Caitlin's work in moving our public programming online has been invaluable this season. In fact, she's filming me as I speak. And finally, let me just observe that at the beginning of each of these videos, you'll see two short films. Uh, the first will be a funds appeal from our executive director, Mark Thompson. Uh, and the second will be a short movie about the Whitehorn House Museum. I hope you'll seriously consider Mark's appeal and possibly donate to the Newport Restoration Foundation. And I hope you find the information that we share really interesting. And that if you can, you'll come to Newport this summer and visit us at the White House Museum. Enjoy the show. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Thompson and I'm Executive Director of the Newport Restoration Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this program today. Our founder, Doris Duke, was enamored with the 18th century. Evidence of her passion for restoring 18th century houses is all around us here in Newport. But she also had an avid interest in objects related to domestic life. And ultimately, she assembled a wonderful collection of furniture created here in Rhode Island and in Newport in particular. As you may know, Newport furniture represents some of the finest work of 18th century American decorative arts. And we are thrilled to be able to share our collection with you at the Whitehorn House Museum. This program is part of our ongoing effort to tell the story of that furniture and to the people who made it and to the people who acquired it. This program has been generously supported by a grant from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. As you might imagine, the work of the Whitehorn House Museum relies upon the generosity of many individuals and corporations who share our passion for 18th century history and 18th century material culture. If this description fits you, we hope you'll consider donating to the Newport Restoration Foundation. It's easy to do. Just visit our website at newportrestoration.org and click on the word support. Any amount that you can afford to give will be genuinely appreciated. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Your study is like detective work. When NRF first acquired this chest on chest in 1973, it was believed to be the work of master Newport craftsman John Goddard. The distinctive legs and block and shell front suggested it was made in Newport, but the rosettes are more typical of Providence workshops. A recent investigation has revealed that it was not the work of John Goddard, but rather his nephew Daniel Spencer. Spencer possibly trained in his uncle's workshop in Newport and later produced pieces with his own distinct style, including this chest on chest, in Providence, Rhode Island. Researchers discovered a set of marks on the inside of the drawers which were the exact match of other Daniel Spencer pieces. The one or owl pictured here is on the interior of a lower section drawer and was used by Daniel Spencer and his brother Thomas. In Daniel Spencer's workshop, the interior backs of drawers were labeled alphabetically with looping graphite letters in the center. The first was A, the second was B, etc. 
This example is drawer C. For more furniture findings, visit us at Whitehorn House Museum or visit us online at newportrestoration.org slash whitehornhouse. Let's begin tonight's program in earnest. I, I, it's, it's a really a great thrill uh, to introduce tonight's panelists. And gentlemen, I hope that you'll forgive me. My introductions are perhaps a little more personal than the average academic introduction, but we'll see. Um, let me begin with Brock Job. Uh, Brock Job is Professor Emeritus at the Winterthur Program in American Material Culture at the Winterthur Museum in Delaware. He holds a BA in history from Wake Forest University, an MA from the Winterthur Program, and has been a participant in the widely revered Addingham Summer School, an intense decorative arts and architecture program held across England. Over a 40 plus year career, Brock has held numerous positions in education and curatorial work, and an impressive record of publication and service to the field. Now I'm going to point out two things on his CV that one typically doesn't see in an academic CV that I really get a kick out of. Um, and I believe I talked to you about this the first time I saw your CV, Brock. One is that he sits on the Decorative Arts Advisory Panel for the Internal Revenue Service, something I have never seen in 20 years of reviewing academic CVs. Uh, that was really extraordinary. And then another thing that really stands out is that when you look at Brock's CV, the average, the average academic lists every every presentation they've ever done. I mean, it, the, the CV could go on for 30 pages. Uh, I, Brock, um, in uh, what I think is a really sort of, um, wonderful gesture, just says this. Uh, Over the past 45 years, I have presented hundreds of lectures and workshops on historic American furniture and upholstery. And he has indeed. And I am pleased to say that I can count myself among the many people who have attended and learned from Brock's lectures and workshops, having studied, studied under him briefly uh, at the Historic New England's program in New England Studies. And I can say from personal experience that Professor Job is a kind and innovative educator, a brilliant scholar, and a delightful and supportive colleague. So thanks for coming tonight, Brock. It's really, really wonderful to have you here. And Steve Brown, uh, is an instructor in the furniture making program at the renowned North Bennett Street School in Boston, Massachusetts. He's also a graduate of the same institution. Prior to joining the North Bennett Street faculty, Steve worked um, at Masters of Fine Furniture in Beverly, Massachusetts, and his work has been shown in galleries and museums and has been published in the Fine Woodworking Design book. I first became aware of Steve when I read his 2017 American Furniture article Classical Proportioning in 18th Century Furniture and Design, a piece that he co-authored with Will Neptune. After having read that article, I spoke to Steve for what I believe was over an hour, where I learned a great deal from him. And while throughout our conversations, he has continually protested to me that he is neither a historian nor a scholar, I would beg to differ. Uh, I think his depth of research and the experience that he brings as a maker makes him an ideal scholar in the field of historic furniture. And it's really a pleasure to welcome him to this panel. Uh, Thank thanks you. very much, Steve. Thanks very much, Brock. Uh, this is really great fun for me. I'll say one last sort of personal thing that people may not know. Yesterday was my birthday. This week is one of the greatest birthday presents I could ever get. And <laughs> an hour and a half every day talking to people um, about, uh, about history and, and, and material culture. It really doesn't get any better than that. So let's begin. Um, this is going to be a conversation this evening um, between Brock and Steve and myself. Um, and I want to start out with a question. Uh, one of the driving assumptions of this program is that Newport furniture was important in its day and it continues to be important today. And so I think we should begin by interrogating that assumption and ask both of you, but we'll start with Brock. Um, is that statement true? Was Newport furniture important in the past and does it continue to be important today? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. Eric, I really appreciate that. I have to confess as well, uh, and I'm sure some of you who are out there uh, listening to this uh, presentation today, know that uh, my heart is in Boston <laughs> and much of my work has been uh, north of Newport, uh, focused on eastern Massachusetts and the coast of New Hampshire, extending up into the coast of Maine. So 
please bear in mind as I make my comments tonight that uh, I'm an off islander. I am not a Rhode Islander. Uh, and I have to say, based on looking at the furniture of Newport in particular, and I'm speaking now of the best Newport furniture, it far exceeds anything made in the Boston area or in along the coast of uh, northern coast of New England during the second and third quarters of the 18th century. It is absolutely extraordinary furniture. And you ask the question, was it important in its day? Well, those of you that heard Pat Kane speak last night will probably remember the point that she made about the number of pieces that were sent out from Newport. Some of it plain, unadorned objects that were part of the export trade. But there was also a great number of pieces that were extremely ornate and ended up in, in the homes of merchants and ship captains and uh, well-to-do people up and down the Atlantic coast. I remember specifically, she showed a wonderful uh, piece of furniture a great uh, bureau table that had belonged to John Deshan, Deshan of New London. And you think about John Brown and Jabez Bowen of Providence and their orders to Newport. Uh, it's clear that people within the geographical sphere of Newport were well aware of the furniture made there. Terrific. Um, Brock, were there any of the images in the PowerPoint that you wanted to talk about at this well, point? Well, why don't we uh, bring up the PowerPoint and we'll just start with sure. the let me, let me bring it first up. image. Okay. Well, I put that slide on the screen first and foremost because when I think of Newport, and again, as a out-of-towner, and I think of what symbolizes the furniture of that, uh, of the, this community. Uh, you can't help but think about these striking, graceful, sculptural shells. And it's true that cabinet makers in southeastern Connecticut and throughout southeastern Massachusetts, they did imitate these shells. Indeed, in Providence, uh, we see makers some of whom were trained in Newport, who took that Newport style to Providence. Uh, but there's nothing more, in my mind, nothing more beautiful when it comes to 18th century furniture than that shell. There's a reason why that shell has been used as the logo for so many uh, furniture-related societies and uh, clubs, you just don't get any better than this. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a magnificent shell uh, from a John Townsend uh, bureau table at Winotour. Mm -hmm. And we can talk for hours about mm -hmm. this one shell, but right. they're stopped. Right. Um, so Steve, um, same question. Um, and from any sort of angle that you care to sort of think about it, um, was Newport furniture important? To your mind, and and is it important today? What are what are your what are your thoughts on that? I'm thinking back to when I was a student at the North Bennett Street School, and um, I was there from '88 to '89 or '88 to '90, and I believe while I was a student, that was when Alan Breed was um, commissioned to do the reproduction of the Newport mm -hmm. Secretary that sold for the record. Brock, you, you can say what which secretary it was and uh, it was the Nicholas Brown desk and bookcase okay. sold in 1989 for 12.1 million dollars. Okay, that was big news when I was a student in in our program, um, partly because of the 12 million dollars. That was pretty impressive, but the um, <laughs> 
the the opportunity to go and measure and study that piece was what we were you know sort of jealous of um and that that's that um uh endeavor of going and and going over a piece and studying it and you know noticing all the details and trying to soak it in so that you can then go reproduce it is something that we do a lot and we learn an awful lot about the pieces from that now i never got to do it with that piece because you know al breed was ahead of us but um it gave me an appreciation that was my initiation to awareness about newport furniture i didn't know anything about period furniture before that um so that certainly gave me some sense of its current importance and just you know over time um becoming more familiar with period furniture and seeing the differences and um, the, the tendencies in, in regions and with makers. Clearly the Newport furniture stands out like Brock was saying, um, it, you know, it's just, what comes to mind when I think of it is, uh, it's just very elegant. It's somewhat restrained, mm -hmm. but there's, there's still, there's a lot of embellishment, a lot of detail but it's not not quite as busy as some of the other you know regions um so yeah i would i would uh i would imagine it was quite important in the day you know obviously if there's that much of it it was uh somebody was valuing it right i i i, I don't I, I hope you don't mind brock there's a question that um that's sort of in the connected to the points we discussed, but never was quite framed as a question. I'm going to ask it now, if you don't mind, um, sure. which is, so why Newport, right? What was it, uh, you know, what was it about Newport at, that, I had the same question of Pat last night as well, which was to say, Pat pointed out both the way in which Newport furniture expanded out into the world and the way in which uh, Newport makers expanded into the world, and then the way in which the world then sort of um, influenced subsequent generations yes. of people who began in Newport. What was it about Newport? Is it the placement of Newport? Is it is it a unique population of Newport? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my initial thought is, <laughs> and you'll have to excuse me for saying this, but I think it has it's it's serendipity. Mm -hmm. It uh, it is the remarkable arrival of uh, the two brothers, Job and Christopher Townsend, from my perspective, that have a huge impact on the development of this Newport style as we think of it. Uh -huh. uh, Job and, and Christopher kind of set the scene and then the next generation, which is headlined by John Townsend, Christopher's son, and by uh, John Goddard, uh, really take it to a to a to a new level, uh -huh. and you have to you have to factor in I think another important ingredient, uh, and that is Newport remains a rather closed community as uh, in terms of its cabinet making world. And by close community, I mean, unlike Philadelphia or New York, uh, where there is an influx of immigrants, many of whom are coming from Britain, Ireland, in the case of Philadelphia, coming from uh, the German states, they have, those immigrants have enormous impact in Philadelphia, New York, and other communities as well along the Atlantic seaboard. Newport through Christopher and Job are able to set a style. And then that style is perpetuated by their apprentices, whom in many cases are related either directly as sons or grandsons, or they're related by marriage, such as the case of John Goddard who marries yeah. Hannah um, Townsend, Job Townsend's daughter. So 
what I find fascinating about Newport is that it develops its own distinctive identity. And that identity is truly driven by very talented craftsmen. What if Newport had been controlled by a couple of pedestrian craftsmen? <laughs> <laughs> what would we have seen? We might have seen something far different. Right. But uh, it's the serendipity of those craftsmen who arrive. Newport takes advantage of its seaport. But you could argue that Boston, the coast of Connecticut, the New Hampshire coast, any of those communities could have taken advantage of the seaport, of their seaport connections, their commercial ties. And in fact, they did. Many of those communities sent furniture out to other places. But Newport was different. And to me, it's the serendipity of these individual craftsmen. We can't overstate the importance of key individuals in making a difference in the 18th century. Right. And that leads to a thought that we, we were talking about at the beginning of the program, or before the program began, in relation to your PowerPoint, actually, about so these individuals working in this particular place at this particular moment created a style, right? Created a set of forms that we typically identify with Newport. This is as somebody who spent two decades um, working in a very, very different field. Um, these are things I've been learning about very recently. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit um, about those forms, um, both to inform those who don't know about that, although many people on the Zoom webinar well, Why don't we go build. on to the next image? Right, but also the images are just extraordinary. So let's share yeah. the images. Well. If I can. Ah, there we go. And this next image that I put up on the screen, uh, I wanted to make that point that these Newport, this Newport style in some ways never died in Newport. Mm -hmm. uh, I love this quote from Maury Heckscher's book on John Townsend. Uh, and you see it there, I have never, and again, Maury is speaking at the opening of the book, I have, uh, there was never a time when Newport totally forgot its famous 18th century cabinet makers, the Townsends and Goddards. And some of you who listened in last night may remember the reference that Pat made to that 1849 newspaper account, which goes into great detail about the, the cabinet making tradition that existed in Newport in the 18th century. They're looking back in 1849. They're looking back just uh, 75 years earlier at a significant cabinet making tradition that existed in Newport. And you also have to remember that many of these members of the Goddards and Towns and families were continuing to work well into the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising in a way in a town like Newport, which undergoes significant financial reversals and economic downturn in the late 18th uh, and the early 19th century, in a way, these individuals are looking back to the mid 18th century as the glorious time, as the golden years for mm. uh, furniture making. And then I think that is accentuated in the late 19th century with the development of Newport as a resort community. And with that, an interest in among some members of that community in antique furniture. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's really extraordinary how these Newport pieces are appreciated for so long, yeah. right up to the present day. Hmm. Would you like to go to the next image, you think? Um, sure. Yeah, these, are, yeah. these pieces are extraordinary. And when you, when you think of what would have excited people in the 18th century, and frankly, continued to interest people in the 19th, uh, and certainly interest us today, it's these iconic forms from Newport, whether you speak of high chests, and we'll see in a moment 
uh, the block and shell pieces that we associate with Newport. But let's look for just a moment at these, uh, these images. And I don't know if you can see uh, what I had written at the bottom of the screen, but let me just tell you, we're looking at three high chests of drawers. Uh, the one on the left is the earliest of the three. Uh, it's signed by John Townsend. It's a piece that came up for sale at Sotheby's a, a, a number of years ago. And it's dated 1756, an extraordinary high chest, which shows that fully developed uh, Newport style. The only uh, difference from what you'll see later on is that the shell is inverted, as you can see there in the center of the, uh, uh, of the, of the dressing table portion of the, shell, of the, of the piece. Uh, but it has all the earmarks that we associate with Newport craftsmen. And again, this is a piece by John Townsend, who would have learned his trade from, John, uh, from his father, Christopher. And then you see a high chest in the middle, also by John Townsend, uh, but made a few years later, 1759, where you have a more typical shell that becomes characteristic of that uh, later period in Townsend's career. Uh, that piece is in the middle is at, in the Yale collection. And then finally, you see a, uh, a third example of this high chest style uh, from Newport. And it's remarkable how consistent these pieces are. Pat Kane can identify the individual makers of so many Newport pieces. But for the rest of us, if we just look at these Newport pieces, we know they're Newport. Uh -huh. We may not know who made them, but we know they're Newport. And it's a consistency of style that, frankly, I don't see elsewhere. It's certainly not true of Boston. It's not true of uh, other communities. There's far more variety within Philadelphia, and New York, Boston. But in Newport, there's a they identify a style and then they just perfect it. Mm. Um, and we'll see that in the next image too. Sure, let me see if I can pull that up. There you go. And again, everybody who is listening in now is familiar with these forms. Uh, on the left, a, what's, what was often called a bureau table in the period, we, we refer to them as knee hole desks, but uh, there you have the, the glorious shells, these scalloped shells with a smaller uh, uh, basket of, uh, with hatchwork at the center of the shells. Uh, this happens to be a classic example on the left of John Townsend's work, as is the example on the right uh, uh, the example on the right at the Metropolitan Museum, the example on the left at Winotour. But these are just breathtakingly beautiful pieces of furniture. I mean, God, I look at them on the screen and I just want to, I want to take them apart. I want to look at every detail. And I know Steve's going to talk more about the construction. Um, but if you open these up, they're just as revealing of their beauty, of their sophistication, of their perfection on the inside as they are on the outside. And I did have one last image uh, sure. here of just another iconic form. Oh, yeah. Which again, Pat talked about last night. There are only a half dozen of these that survive. This happens to be one at Winotour. This one's documented to John Goddard. But just kind of cast your eye on the rippling movement of those, of that skirt. And we're going to talk later about the knee carving. But oh my god, the, the <laughs> knee carving on Newport pieces is unlike anything that you see elsewhere. And then those sculptural ball and claw feet. Uh, these were frequently referred to, uh, in fact, in bills as a scalloped tea table 
or China table. Both terms were used in the 18th century. Uh, for those of you that are interested in uh, valuations, uh, you get some sense of how important these pieces are, both in their, in their day when they were made, they were extremely costly. But uh, as some of you may know, uh, one of these came up for sale, oh, perhaps seven or eight years ago, and uh, brought over $8 million. In fact, Newport Furniture consistently has brought the highest prices at auction. Steve referred to that great Nicholas Brown desk and bookcase that brought 12.1 million. But you can go down through the list of pieces of furniture that set records in the auction houses beginning in the 1970s. And you will see time and time and time again that when a great piece of Newport furniture comes up, it sets the record. And hey. it's just extraordinary. I, I, so, actually, I actually go ahead, spent Steve. time in October uh, studying this piece down at Winterthur. I was down there for two weeks studying different pieces, and this was one that they brought out for me to study. And Mark Anderson made sure I, I knew about that auction, but, <laughs> <laughs> which did not uh, did not calm me down. To, right. <laughs> it is um, just amazingly beautiful. So I have two questions for you, Steve. Um, the first is in light of uh, Brock's many comments in public today um, about the superiority of Newport to Boston. Will Brock ever be allowed in Boston again? And then um, the <laughs> hey, second- Welcome back as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> the second question um, in a more serious vein um, was I think as Brock alluded to, um, you know, that these forms um, emerge from methods. And are those methods, are they unique to Newport? What can we understand about those methods that tell us, you know, that may, that'll certainly help us understand the significance of these pieces in their day and, and maybe teach us something about furniture making today? Um, is this the last slide in your presentation, Brian? I've got a couple more, but they and they relate to issues of construction. So didn't didn't you have one with um, a Boston knee carving? Yeah, yeah. Would you if like you me want to move to, go move to, to the it? next image? Yeah, could and we we'll go just, to that? I'll just walk through a couple of these just to make the point about some of these distinctive features. Uh, just a couple of points that I wanted to make uh, as it relates to that tea table which you just saw on the screen. Uh, again, one of the nice features, I think, about uh, John Goddard's work on these tea tables is that he veneers the upper portion of the leg. So when you're looking at that left hand image on the screen, you'll notice that the grain of that uh, panel above the rear leg, the grain is running in the same direction as the rail. That panel above the leg, above the knee of the leg, is a piece of veneer laid over a vertical grained extension of the leg. Uh, you don't have to do that, but in, in Goddard's case, he did. It gives you a wonderful flow to the grain pattern. Um, also, the way in which he has shaped those side rails, and again, Goddard has done this on a number of pieces, not just tea tables, but other forms as well, uh, to give you a sense of movement that I find absolutely beautiful. And I, last of all, when you look at that top, that, that elevated um, uh, rim to the table, what always has struck me as surprising is that that rim is not an applied rim, but rather it is integral to the top of the table, which means that they are going to have to scoop away. There's a tremendous amount of waste in the creation of that tabletop. Uh, and it, it complicates the process of building that tabletop uh, enormously. Uh, yeah, if you want to go to the next image, yep. and I'll just finish yeah, up quickly to get yep. to the point that Steve wanted 
to talk about is, uh, and we can come back to this image of the mm -hmm. feet, because I know Steve wants to talk about feet, but I guarantee you there are no feet produced, any, at least anywhere in New England, New York, or Philadelphia, quite like uh, these bold sculptural feet that you see coming out of Newport, Rhode Island. Now, these are all the work of different craftsmen. Uh, John Goddard on the left, John Townsend in the center, and an unidentified Newport craftsman on the right. But uh, they're just tour de force. They go far beyond what's necessary in creating a ball and claw. Yeah. And the next image, if you could bring that up, um, we'll go. see the iconic knee carving. And we can come back to this, but if you could go to the next image, it's the one that um, Steve was referencing. And on the left, you see a, a, a very good example. It's really quite, quite well done uh, example of Boston knee carving. And you see it's an acanthus leaf with a series of lobes kind of spilling out from the top of the knee. And it's certainly, attractive. Uh, but when you look at the creativity of the knee carving on the right, the Newport, which is also based on an acanthus leaf concept, but it's far more imaginative. And in my way, in my way of thinking, far more successful in its um, execution. Uh, it's really quite an extraordinary uh, bit of leaf carving. And again, this is the work of John Townsend on the right. Uh -huh. um, and I'll leave it to Steve to comment. Steve, did you want to comment on this slide or the slide before? Well, just, just in terms of what I would notice and you know what, what sort of jumps out at me with these is there's some similarity. The knees have sharp corners left mm -hmm. on the outside in both cases, and that's, mm -hmm fairly common for both Boston and Newport. Um, so that allows you to use a flat pattern that you can lay on that surface, trace out that outline and sort of stamp out that, you know, the, the outline of the leafage. And then you can do the little bit of modeling. Actually, both of these um, are rather high relief compared to some examples. You'll see much lower and flatter, uh, thinner depth in uh, other Boston and, and Newport ones. Um, but they're both sort of known for that, not, not heavy modeling, um, not a lot of movement like you'd see in Philadelphia carving. But yeah, the, uh, the Newport carving, my impression, first time I saw it, and it still um, strikes me that way, it's almost like etching. Um, very thin, um, but very neatly done. And the thinness and, um, in a sense, the straightforwardness of that is deceptive because it's, it's unforgiving. It would, you would have to be quite meticulous to accomplish it. Whereas if you look at Philadelphia carving, you know, some of the nice carving, you don't have to have the same kind of um, meticulousness in a, se in a sense. It's a little more forgiving. You could you could have some differences, and your eye won't pick it up because it's so busy. But here you have you know a little oops, and it's it's going to mm -hmm. be pretty obvious. Um, so that's not to say one's better than the other. Just just sort of a um, a typical difference, I think, between right. certainly Philadelphia and, and Newport. Right. Steve, did you want me to pull? Oh, you, did you want to share your? screen to talk um, about construction we could we could go to yeah we could it's it's more about technique okay. um all right so these i i sort of put together as a way to make the point one of the things we talked about in our preparation conversations um was sort of the generalization of uh newport style being the word fussy was used i'm the one who brought it up um, but fastidious maybe sounds less um, 
judgmental. Um, <laughs> you know, and I never meant fussy to, to be judgmental, but it has a very careful, methodical, fastidious character to it. Whereas some of the Boston stuff, certainly some of the Philadelphia stuff, uh, not quite the same. Um, uh, both with the the embellishment and the the details that you were meant to see, and that would be you know as cleaned up as they were going to get, and with the the inner stuff, so that you look at the inside of a dressing table from Newport, it's going to look neat compared to a Boston dressing table on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, the only person that I can think of, or the only other maker that I can think of that sort of is comparable to the Newport neatness would be uh, Eliphalet Chapin. And it's, it's mind boggling how neat both of them were. You know, when you think about the fact that you were trying to, you know, make a living doing this, that you would bother to go to this, the extent that they did is, is surprising. Um, but it says something, you know, about, about them as craftsmen. So this is um, looking at on the left, I believe it's a um, John Townsend foot. I think it was from, uh, the John Townsend book by Heckscher. And then on the right is a Chapin foot. I'm sort of throwing it in as a Philadelphia foot. Um, he trained in Philadelphia and I've seen feet almost exactly like this on, uh, there was a Philadelphia chair that went on sale at an auction. The whole chair looked like a Chapin chair, but it was a Philadelphia chair. Um, and this is just to make the point about how much goes into the thinking um, and, and the designing and, and then the execution of these uh, forms and then to point out the difference. And I'm, I'm just, this may seem like I'm going down a rabbit hole. So hopefully <laughs> it, you can follow me and it'll make sense and not take too long. Um, but in, in looking at a cabrio leg with a sim simpler foot, this is from the Frothingham chest, um, the dressing table that I wrote about um, from Winterthur. And this is what I would call a pattern view of the leg. So this is looking straight on the leg, either straight in front or straight from the side. And you can notice how um, straight the ankle is all the way down to the foot. It's not really what you think you're looking at when you see a cabrio leg. You think everything's curving. But this is what the pattern looks like. Um, if you look at the um, diagonal view, and this is a just a model that I have from school, basically the same foot, same leg. This is a cross section or a silhouette of the diagonal view, and you see a lot of curve in the front, more curve, and uh, you see curve in the back that we didn't see in the other view. Um, now, in my view, our pictures are covering the picture on the right, so hopefully everybody can see that that right view, and this is just comparing on the left, the straight pattern view, the, the um, diagonal view on the left. And this was, this spoke to their understanding of the spatial relationship that was happening. You have a circular ankle and you have a circular foot and that foot was the size of the blank. So that circle filled that square blank. And they knew that when you had the circle of the ankle back in the corner, in the back corner, that that would give you curvature in the diagonal view and basically all the views except for the pattern view so that just just speaks to the sophistication of that spatial understanding and this is just very quickly this is from uh, from the article this is the geometry that went into designing that Frothingham foot and this on the left is the blank and this is drawing what they call a root two rectangle can you see my cursor Mm -hmm. Moving? Okay. I can. So this, this diagonal of, of the square is the height of this, what they call root two rectangle. And this remnant below the square is the height of the foot. So they were using geometry to, to start with that. This is essentially a drawing of what the foot looks like from the bottom. And if you draw these diagonals and you draw the square that the diagonals and the circles sort of outline and you draw a circle within that, that becomes the circle below the circle of the rim of the foot. And then if you take this diagonal and you set a compass to that and you swing that point and you swing that point, 
then use that as the center, that swings the first part of the curve of the foot. And then if you take that point and you double it and you swing the next arc, that's, that forms the ankle. And the drawing on the right is that drawing overlaid on a tracing of the casting of the foot. So it's remarkably close. It's convincing, I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, this on the left is five stages, just like that first stage of developing what's called the ad quadratum. Every curve in this foot pattern uses one of those stages. So it's hard to argue that this was accidental. That's, that's the main point here. Mm. Not just a, they didn't get lucky and, and end up <laughs> with that. So with this simple foot, you have all of this sort of sophisticated understanding going into drawing it. Um, and then in, in addition, the, the curves that form the ankle are the same curves that form the knee. So there's this sort of rotational symmetry um, there. Again, hard to, hard to attribute that to coincidence. Um, you get into to ball and claw feet and you start thinking about the spatial things going on there. Um, this again, diagonal view, pattern view. Um, they're always working from a square blank. They're making the ball as big as they can within the blank. And that leaves room for the toes in the corner of the blank, in the corners of the blank. If you're going to chop out, you know, if you're going to um, pump out a set of chairs with 12, 12 chairs with 24 legs, they need to look alike. So you need mm -hmm. a method, you need a system. And one way is to have some sort of figured out reference points that have something to do with your pattern. That would be known information. If this is a cross section, they wouldn't have seen that cross section, but they would have understood it in their heads is, is really the point. Hmm. Um, this, this is just showing this, I'm, you know, I, I made these cross sections for my students when I teach this foot. And the idea is that these knuckle ridges, they really sort of appear to stand up perpendicular to the part of the ball that they're on, which is kind of anatomical, like when you, you know, if you were gripping a ball, your knuckles would have that sort of appearance. These are castings from an actual uh, Chapin foot, and you can see that the knuckles are doing that. They sort of, you know, are perpendicular to the angle of the curve. And then down on the bottom, uh, this is from Will Neptune's um, research in the Chapin foot. Um, he's arguing, and it's fairly compelling, that there's a geometrical understanding again, to sort of finding these, to developing the ball shape, even within the part that doesn't get carved, so that the part you do carve is more manageable. So when we're looking at comparing, say, a Philadelphia foot on the right and the Townsend foot on the left, um, if you look at the three toes on the Chapin foot, that you can see, and we can assume that the one on the other side, the fourth one is the same as, as this side toe. They're all the same. You know, up to this level, that, that foot is symmetrical all the way around. Um, so that makes it more producible. That makes it, you know, more efficient to make. It's still an effective, you know, result. Um, you can even see down here the, the talons on the Chapin foot could be done with a flat chisel. They're just two flats and there's a ridge. Nobody should be down there anyways, right? Nobody should be down there on the floor <laughs> looking at your feet. They, they'll, they'll see that ridge and they'll think, oh, sharp talon. If you look at the Townsend one, those, those talons are now like, they're part of the show. I measured um, the, the feet of that, um, there's a Townsend example at the uh, furniture study. Was that in one of your slides, Brock? No. no. Townsend high chest. Um, oh, yeah, yes. I'm sorry, it was. Okay. Yes. And I measured from the ridge. Each talon had a ridge, a corner on it. And it measured exactly from corner to corner uh, to the blank size. So, you know, that, that was essentially part of the original square blank that they could have started with. Um, so there's a, they're sort of, they're trying to maximize what they're getting out of the wood um, and doing it with a lot of care. Um, but if you look at the, the talons on these, 
um, none of them are the same. The two mm -hmm. side ones must be the same, but opposite directions. Um, but you got, you know, um, three knuckles here, two knuckles here, one knuckle back there. Um, you got the piercing, the, the, bar, the ball surface that's revealed over here, it's really the same height, same amount of ball showing. Over here, it goes back considerably further uh, than it does back here. So it's not to say that the Newport makers weren't concerned with efficiency, but they certain, this design was not just designed to be efficient. They sacrificed some efficiency to, to produce these. Now, I spoke with um, Alan Breed two days ago, sort of in preparation for this, because he's carved ball and claw feet like maybe nobody else, maybe other than Jeffrey Green. Um, I've never carved a Newport ball and claw foot. I've never had to. Um, so trying to understand, you know, what it would take to carve a Philadelphia foot versus a Newport foot. Um, it's hard to know what they would have done, but his, his guess, given what he's experienced, is that the, the Newport foot would take four times as long, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think the foot on the right, uh, I think it's reasonable to expect that they could have done that in half an hour to an hour which is fast, an hour is fast, half an hour is really fast. Um, so maybe two hours, I was gonna guess two to four hours for a foot like this um, on the left, if you knew what you were doing and you'd done them before. Um, so that, that, that says something about the importance to them of the design, not just being about making a buck, not just being about um, getting it done quickly. It did, Al, Al um, made the point that he did see himself, he thinks, in Townsend's later feet, a little more efficiency creeping in. So maybe he got tired and just, was like, <laughs> they're not going to notice. I don't know. Um, but he, you know, he really did sort of agree with the idea that, yeah, they could have been a lot more efficient. Um, this is just to try to illustrate a little bit about the difference in efficiency. This is a slipper foot. It's, it's a slipper foot that I incorporate in a project that we do at the school where we actually do a footstool with four different uh, cabrio legs and four different feet. And the first one, the simplest one, is a slipper foot based on a Rhode Island tea table that's at the Pendleton collection. And this, this is just a time-lapse video just to give you some idea of that this is a process. You have lines, you have a pattern, uh, you, you know, might be laid out, might be done with a pattern, but um, the efficiency comes from having a method, you know, basically woodworking can be thought of as knowing where to draw the lines and knowing how to cut to them. And that, you know, it's not just a matter of being skillful or artistic or talented. Those are nice things and they're part of it too, but there's information and there's a process. So this is pretty quick. Pretty self-explanatory too, hopefully. So that's the pattern that we use. This is also a geometrically developed pattern. Just roughing it out with a chisel. I missed a little here somehow with the beveling. That, that happens way too quickly, but you bevel down to that inner line, round the heel a little bit. Basically, um, doing this part of the foot, not touching the top, it was about five minutes. So, and the same thing for a pad foot. You could probably do a pad foot, turn pad foot in five minutes, you know, real turner, certainly. So there's a big difference between a customer ordering, you know, slipper foot or ball and claw foot. So, you know, so much, um, so much effort and care went into something um, like that, that kind of ball and claw foot not just more than the other kind of feet, but so much more than the other regions. Yeah. Um, I want to continue with this discussion about fussiness because in, in our previous conversation, um, it, it wasn't just, as, as I recall, I can't remember which of you said it, but it, it wasn't just that um, they were so fastidious that 
uh, they worked on these feet, which I, I think is, is sort of really important. And I've posited before that I think a lot of this has to do with consumerism as well. But also, was it you, Steve, or was it Brock, that said even the drawer rails were finished um, you know, in ways that you wouldn't see. The, there, there's a piece at Winterthur where you can still see bark on a, on a oh, drawer yeah. rail. But in Newport, they would even finish the rails that the drawers slide in on. Is that, right. is that so For some reason, dressing tables have become, some, become something that I've paid a lot of attention to. And I don't know why, but they're really great examples of uh, different constructions and, and different levels that people go to. So I don't know if it was Brock that took me up to see it, but I, I went up to see the um, dressing table in Henry DuPont's bedroom. Mm -hmm. You know that one, Brock? Yes. Oh, it's a yes. great example of, of sort the of- Boston veneered cabrio all, leg all table. sort of slap together techniques. I mean, yeah. in, which I love. You know, there's, it, it has, um, there's no lap dovetails on the drawers. They threw dovetail the, the drawer front and then veneered over that. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the lap. Um, and then on the inside, you know, aside from the other, you know, fairly crudely done construction, one of the drawer guides um, just applied to the inside side rail to help the drawer, you know, not, fall off into space, um, has bark on two edges of it. So all they did is take this piece of wood and planed it flat, planed it parallel, and then slapped it on. There's, there's glue dripping down from it. Um, I, I, I just thought that was awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did, I, you know, I love seeing, it's, it's like you can see what happened. But some of the, um, I think it was at the, Hexer show, uh, the the show for the Townsend book. Um, he had some Pembroke tables that were upside down. Yes. And just looking at some of the um, the neatness of the parts, the construction underneath that you would never see unless somebody flips it over, you know, on the floor. Uh, it just was astounding. And, and it was just hard for me to get my, I was so used to having gotten used to the less than fastidious work in some of these other regions. And then seeing this, it was just like, well, didn't they have to pay bills? <laughs> it was, I don't, it was I don't know if it's possible. Can you pull up my uh, PowerPoint again, Eric? Of course I can. Because sure. that last image actually is in reference to what Steve is discussing. But there you go. There it is. And just to reinforce what Steve has mentioned, uh, this is a documented John Townsend Pembroke table in the collections at Winotour. And this may well have been loaned to the Townsend show at, uh, at the Metropolitan Museum a number of years ago. It was certainly featured in Maury Heckscher's book. Uh, but if you turn that table upside down, uh, there are several things that you, you will see First of all, when you look carefully at the brackets uh, in the corners of that frame, you'll discover that the brackets are actually tenoned up into the underside of that uh, lower rail, and they're also tenoned into the leg. And you can see that in the drawing, which is actually taken directly from Maury Hexer's book on John Townsend. The fact that that bracket is tenoned in place is extremely unusual, extremely unusual. Uh, Pembroke tables were made in many communities uh, in the second half of the 18th century, up and down the coast from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, right down to Philadelphia and into the South. But generally, those brackets are going to be secured with a couple of tiny sprig nails. They'll also be glued, but also reinforced with sprig nails. Uh, John Townsend goes the extra mile and tenons those um, brackets in place. Uh, in addition, when you 
when you, if you had this table flipped over, and I'm sorry, I don't have an image of it, you will see five cross braces to reinforce the uh, joinery of that uh, table. You'll see cross braces on the underside of the table. Uh, again, they weren't absolutely necessary to hold that table together, but uh, Townsend was fastidious. I think Steve's word is a very <laughs> good one. Uh, fastidious in his approach to construction. Uh, some people talk about his obsessive perfectionism. Uh, he really went to extraordinary lengths in building his furniture. Uh, but it's also important to point out that not all Newport furniture, and certainly not all Rhode Island furniture, has that same degree of fastidiousness. Uh, we've been speaking tonight about really the best of the Newport pieces. And uh, as Pat Kane mentioned last night, uh, particularly when you get up into Providence, some of those Boston features creep in and perhaps maybe uh, they are not quite as fastidious in their construction, uh, those, those uh, Newport, I'm sorry, those Providence makers. But in Newport, among the very best makers, the work is extraordinary. Um, so I would like to, I, it, we, we've been at this for a while now, um, the time really flies. I want to ask one last question because I do want to give an opportunity for people um, on, uh, for, in the audience to ask some questions, um, which is, uh, it's a sort of broad speculative question, which is that, as I mentioned at the beginning of our program, uh, the Whitehorn House Museum has shifted its focus to thinking about its furniture collection. We're, we're thinking about other crafts as well, we're, but um, certainly furniture is our primary focus. Um, and I don't know if you've been down there since it reopened, Brock. Um, Steve, I'm pretty sure you haven't because we met in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but if money were no object, if um, everybody was ready to just hand us over pieces and resources and what are the things that you would want to see in a museum of Newport furniture, uh, both from a historical perspective, from a maker's perspective, um, from an artistic perspective. I wonder if you guys can comment on that. Why don't we, um, why don't we start with Steve and then we'll, we'll, we'll conclude with Brock. You mean beyond what you have there at this point? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and not just pieces, but what kinds of stories would you want to tell? What, what kinds of things, if you went to a brand new museum of Newport furniture, what would you hope to see? Well, this maybe isn't, I don't know if this answers the question or not. One of the things that I think I certainly myself am interested in, and I, I find people are interested in, is um, illustrations or demonstrations of process. And in particular, um, you know, things that relate to directly to things that are in the collection there. Um, I know the MFA in Boston has art carts and they, they demonstrate how paintings are done and they have one for furniture and that sort of thing. Um, so that may be, I don't know if that's exactly what you're, you're thinking, but either displays that help illustrate that or videos or live demonstrations and talks. It's, I think there's a lot of um, romanticizing of, certainly in furniture making, there's a lot mm -hmm. of romanticizing of the process. And um, I think the reality is more interesting myself. You mm -hmm. know, it's, um, it, it might seem a little technical, but uh, that's part of the attraction in a way, the fact that I, I see beauty in, in technical mm -hmm. accomplishment and, and um, problem solving, just like a mathematician can, can look at a, an equation and see beauty. Right. So for me, um, it's just a nice compliment to that. Mm -hmm. And I have no preconceived notions of, of what the answer should be. I okay, great. Really is quite open. Right. 
So yes, you get an A. Um, <laughs> and, um, and Brock, what are your thoughts on this? Well, two things come to mind. Uh, one is context, uh, putting the furniture in context. And there are so many ways you can do that, but strictly from a furniture historian's perspective, you know, we have focused tonight on the very best furniture made in Newport. And if money were no object and you had unlimited space, I would really like to see a comparison of similar forms made in Newport, but showing you different levels of sophistication. Because there was some bad furniture made right. in Newport. There was some export pieces that were very plain and rather rudimentary. So I think putting the best in a context so that you can appreciate how good they really are is, uh, is one thing I would love to see. The other part of the story, which is so difficult to tell, and I think you'd have to engage in a bit of dramatic uh, fiction, uh, but hopefully historical fiction that has some basis in fact. But what we don't know is what these, what these guys were like as people. What was John Townsend like? Did, did others find him an honest, reputable, decent person? Or was he a crook? Was he a real, uh, you know, fuss budget who was a perfectionist and couldn't put up with anything that wasn't absolutely perfect? Trying to get at the personality of these individuals is so, so difficult. And yet, without that sense of personality, I think we miss an important part of the appreciation of the furniture. Uh, and I don't know how you get that. Uh, as I say, it might have to involve a bit of dramatic fiction. Right. But um, boy, I would love to see more done along that line so that we could understand a little better what it was like for someone who worked in one of these shops Right. And what that interchange between customer and uh, cabinet maker was like. And whether at the end of the day, the cabinet maker was proud of his work or was it just a way to make a buck right. and to feed his family? You know? So that personal side, I wish we could get out in some way. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, Caitlin, have we had any questions? Has anyone had any comments they want to make? Um, yes, yeah, so we've had a, a couple of questions so far. Um, the, fir the first question I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read it first because it actually has to, relates to the um, slide that we have up right now on the Pembroke table. Um, it comes from Ken. Ken sounds like a furniture maker. Um, so I'm going to read the question in entirety because I think um, they can explain it better than I can. <laughs> Um, so Ken is, is basically asking um, with this Pembroke table, um, if the bracket is flush with the front surface of the leg, um, and they say that the tenon on this table is, is it, they're asking if the tenon on this table is centered or flush to the back, the difference is yes. how the bracket will align with the face of the leg. Yeah. Is this? I, I, I imagine whether it's flush in the front or not, that the the tenon is what we would call barefaced in the back that there's not a shoulder um you know in back of the tenon um but there is a shoulder in the front and that that makes the whole thing more difficult like like brock was alluding to you have to you have to fit those shoulders so that they you know close nicely up against the rail and, the, and over against the leg um so i imagine the, what we would do if we were, we've had people build this table, um, they would bareface the tenon in the back, which just means that the cheek of the tenon is the same as the back surface of the whole uh, bracket. So all you have to do is create the front, the thickness of the tenon and the shoulder 
um, to, to finish that off. Did that, was that clear? I mean, <laughs> I, I can't build anything, so okay. it's not clear to me, but I hope it was clear. It can, I, yes. I, okay, yes. Perfect. Let me observe as I see occasionally people leave at this point who don't have any further questions. Um, tomorrow night's program will be with Jeffrey Green and Jonathan Brower, both makers associated, uh, furniture makers associated with Newport. So we're going to continue this makers discussion into tomorrow as well. Um, I'm sorry, Caitlin, why don't you uh, go ahead? Um, all right, so um, a question that we had um, earlier tonight from Gary um, is actually about um, the, the close-up image of the shell that we saw on that first slide at the very beginning. I think I can get us back there. Um, so Gary is interested um, in the cross in the hatching that's at the bottom of the shell because um, they've noticed that um, that it sort of looks like a pineapple and the pineapple is a symbol of Newport. So they're curious if this is intentional or it's just a coincidence. From my own perspective, it's uh, so much of John Townsend's work relies on cross hatching as a form of decoration. To one, one of the advantages of having that cross hatched is that it, it, it's actually a little easier in the sense that if you were to make that perfectly smooth, it would require a lot of special effort. Whereas if you cross hatch it, you, you're gonna hide any of the little imperfections of making that, that area uh, uh, smooth. I doubt that it has any relationship to a pineapple. I, I think it's more of a characteristic of his work and just filling a void uh, there. That's my guess. But, uh, you, you did use the word basket before. Is that just because it kind of looks well, like Well, it's, it's oftentimes referred to by collectors as kind of a basket of flowers okay. idea. Uh, whether that was the intention, I don't know. I just don't know. Great. Um, we also have a question from Larry, um, who is interested in uh, where we can go see a workshop with the tools available to produce this type of furniture um, as it was made in the 18th century. Well, I know that Al Breed does do this in his own workshops, uh, and you can go online and just Google Alan Breed and B-R-E-E-D. And I know he does it, but then a number of others do it as well. Uh, does Jeffrey Green have a shop that he's operating now? Uh, Jeffrey has a, um, a space in um, South Kingstown, uh, um, but it's not quite the same as the place he had in Newport. It's not quite the same okay. as Ball and Claw. Um, but it, yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, and we are trying to bring some of those pieces into into our work, whether they be the genuine article or whether they be reproductions, we're, we're looking if, at that. If I, I could I jump have, in, if, if I could jump in and uh, one other, just in answer to that question, another key person, well, a, a key group is the Society of American Period Furniture Makers, mm -hmm. because they are very involved in teaching and in conducting workshops. And in New England, I don't know, where Larry is located, but in New England, uh, the key person there is a man named Bob Van Dyke. And he runs the, uh, the Connecticut, I think it's called the Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking yep. in Manchester, Connecticut. And Bob Van Dyke, uh, and again, if you Google Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking, you will see, uh, you'll find Bob Van Dyke's name and Bob does workshops on the same kind of thing. If, if somebody was teaching there and teaching this Newport shell, it would likely be Will Neptune, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And many of the, uh, many. Um, another thing that Society of American Period Furniture Makers do is attend um, this webinar. Uh, we, we've had a number of people from all over the country uh, from the society who are, who are joining us for some or all of these programs. 
Um, Caitlin, I don't see any other questions out there. Do you? There's actually one more. Sure. Um, that just came in okay. uh, from Carol Ann, who um, who says that the top of the Townsend table seems plain in relation to the construction. Was this typical of the finest Newport Pembroke table? So it's about the, the Pembroke table again at the end. Let's go back to the Pembroke table. Actually, the, the design of that table uh, with the, the short leaves, the plain top, that would, that really speaks to a, it speaks to English design that is influencing the style of Pembroke tables made up and down the Atlantic coast. So for instance, there are Pembroke tables made in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, made in Boston, uh, that are of the same form. Uh, they're not as finely constructed and they don't have exactly the same bracket pattern. Uh, they don't have the fluting on the legs and what you can't see, and we haven't really talked about it, but these legs have what's called stop fluting, meaning that the legs are fluted. You can see in the, in the uh, design on the right, you can see those four flutes which run down the legs, but about a third of the way from the bottom of the leg, the flutes are actually filled with reeds. Uh, and that stop fluting technique is characteristic of, of a number of makers in Newport who use that stop fluting technique. Uh, this particular stretcher arrangement, the cross stretchers, uh, with the almost Chinese-like uh, lattice work, that's coming out of an English tradition as well. Uh, similar, not identical, but similar patterns appear in a design book by Thomas Chippendale, the London furniture designer, who produced a great book, The Cabinet, or The Gentleman and Cabinet Maker's uh, Director in 1754. But actually the top is, is what you would expect. Uh, you wouldn't expect it to be de decorated. It would not have a rim in the way that a tea table, as we saw earlier, had. Yeah, the wood itself is kind of the embellishment on that yeah. top. That's yeah. fantastic mahogany. Yeah. We have another question. Yes, um, also about the Pembroke table. This is a very yeah. popular table. Yes, very popular. Table. <laughs> um, so this is and uh, is in relation to the um, to the drawing of the of the um, on the right hand side mm -hmm. um, that there's like a dashed section. So they're interested mm -hmm. in what that represents. If you could explain. Those are what we call invisible lines, hidden mm -hmm. lines. It's basically trying to, you know, give you X-ray vision. So what you're seeing in those dotted lines would be the, the edge um, or the end of the tenon um, as it's sunk into uh, those other members, the leg and the rail. That little part to the right, Brock, is that a plug? Do you know from when you copied this? I have the book over here, but I don't want to rifle through it. <laughs> I think it is. I think it's... It's a plug because they cut out the, the mortise a little longer. Right. And then so they, can... they plug that uh, to hide the, uh, the opening of that mortise. So you'd was... be able to insert it up into that mortise and then slide it over into the leg. Correct. And then put the plug in and now it's kind of locked in there as well. Exactly. Other questions, Caitlin? Do we see any more? I think that was it. Okay, well, um, in that case, I'm going to call it a day here. This was, um, this was really terrific. Uh, the whole experience, uh, every time I talk to you guys, I, I have more fun than I did the last time. Um, <laughs> this was really great fun. I learned a lot. I hope everyone in uh, our audience learned a lot. Um, as I said, we're going to be here all week. Um, tomorrow, Jeffrey Green and Jonathan Brower We'll, we'll, um, we'll talk much more exclusively about, about being a maker. Um, and then on Friday, uh, we're bringing museum people to the table, several people from the Newport Restoration Foundation, 
um, Ruth Taylor from the Newport Historical Society, to talk about what these pieces mean within our collections um, as museum professionals. And um, I think that is a fascinating story as well, some of which Brock alluded to earlier on about um, our efforts to bring context and new stories to, to these uh, pieces. Um, and I hope uh, all of you can join us. This is, um, as I said, this is a really great treat for me. I hope it is for all of you. So I guess all that remains for tonight is to thank Steve Brown, Brock Job, Caitlin Seller, uh, my partner in crime here. And um, we will see you all tomorrow. Thanks very much. Have a good night, happy, everybody. Happy birthday. Ah, thanks. <laughs> I'm only thank 30. You. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Good night. Bye. Good night, everybody.